Hi, friends, colleagues. Hope you're doing well. We're going to continue with our banana series or banana bites. Today, we're going to discuss the technique, right, the how to, at least one of the how to's of how to treat a pseudoaneurysm, a ruptured dorsal wall pseudoaneurysm. So, hope you find it useful. Today, it also happens to be the Valdezier week. Um, in April as it happens to be. So here's to AVM win as it is this week. Been working on it. Um, and here we go. This is a patient that presents with subarachnoid hemorrhage. This is the initial evaluation. Standard angiogram under anesthesia. Left carotid. Vert. Here we see a not so subtle, probably, abnormality in the supraclinoid segment. Lateral mm -hmm. is not too bad. Here's the measurements, will become important later. 3.3, 3.4. Not too, too, it's a little bit hard to tell exactly what's going on here from these pictures. But of course, do this. So here is a obviously a volumetric reconstruction. Um, you see that things are a little bit more clear. Here's largely the rupture point. There's a fusiform dilatation of this vessel. Probably a more or less typical story of kind of like a segmental vascular injury right here. We believe probably these are all dissections. We'll uh, see how that plays out a little bit later. That's what we got, right? Okay. This is six days later. This is the treatment. It should arrives. Again, we do is a common carotid this time, <clears throat> just to check and make sure. Volumetric stuff. Right, I see it. This. Here's the injection. Right away, you can notice that things are not moving in the right direction. This sort of pseudoaneurysmal part is bigger. Now here, you also can see something important. See this little narrowing here? Now, what could that be? Now you have to put it together. The other vessels are fine. So could this be focal spasm? Certainly, it could be. Um, the other possibility is that this is another sign of a dissection, right? A little narrowing where the dissection begins. Often these begin here. I think it's likely a dissection. So these usually begin somewhere here, and then the dorsal wall thing is where it tends to rupture, right? So we have this. Now, the other thing that's important is if we look at this, okay, here's the source. We're getting our big imaging again. That later. Now look at this. Here you go. Ah, measurements. Remember that 3.3 .3 before? Look at this 2.7, 4.05. So here we get into this good stuff, right? Like how do you treat it? It's a flow diverter treatment. We're not going to discuss the pros and cons of sacrificing these segments. Let's just Except that this is a flow diverter case. And that's what we're going to do. Um, how do you size it? You go back. It's important to go back and measure the original angiogram. You size it to the 3.3, you size it to the 2.7. Now we can also do this and look at what this has become. And this has become a good, whatever, foreign change, right? So, what to do? The answer is, and there is the right answer, is that, right? the answer is that we have to size to the 3.3, the original size of the vessel, because it is not unlikely that the vessel will recover. If the vessel recovers, if we undersize, we can expect more for shortening and potentially the construct falling into the pseudoaneurysmal segment. Maybe, maybe not, but 
combination of this appearance dictates of how we're going to treat this. If we put uh, something, whatever we're going to put, if you oversize, say a 3.5, what will happen is we'll have under coverage of this segment where the colloidal comes from and so forth. And so that might play into our favor. And we're going to have a lot of coverage here when we load the device. So some of the strategy is starting to come together a little bit. Now we're going to leave this alone for a second. Let me go in here. There's the uh, volumetric volume rendered image. Hmm. Let me see what that looks like. A little bit slow on the packs, so. Okay, that's the aneurysm, and there's the stenosis, right? Okay. Here's the view. Now, the views are also important. This view is done with the purpose of maximizing the distal location. We don't really care as much about looking at the aneurysm as we do about the landing zones. So the landing zone distally needs to be well displayed as well as proximal. It looks like the frontal oblique is the best view for that. Here's the lateral. The lateral is not great, but the best lateral here allows you to do a couple of things. So first of all, you see the bifurcation here pretty well. You see this whole ugliness here. You see the stenosis, and you kind of see the landing zone in the proximal segment. So between these two, we're going to be fine. This is a standard transfemoral <clears throat> approach. This is an onion. It's a BMX, Navian, Enum, Deal, um, the very Aristotle 14 there. So here we go. Wire, J, standard thing, there's the phenom. Right there, I have the main thing here. And here's the device. Now, we did, before we did this, I actually gave a little bit of verapamil just to make sure that this stayed okay and didn't spasm as we were manipulating it with these things. It's a little bit dicey, do we want to do that or not? But I think it's important to think of giving verapamil at this point. We expect that these vessels might be a little bit sensitive. So we gave like 2.5. Okay, so here's a pipeline. It's a 375 by 14. That was the one that we ultimately chose. And uh, there's the technique. Now we don't favor this drop and drag thing, um, especially in these locations where precise placement here is important. I think it's probably a little bit more favorable to just place it like this and open exactly where you want it. As long as they're under four millimeters, they'll behave very nicely in these kinds of situations. They tend to open well. So here it is, opens a little bit more distal. Let me pull it back a tiny bit. You can see you can precisely place it just at the target. There we go. Now we're pushing <clears throat> a little bit of forward load. You see how it opens in this segment. That's what we really want. We want to maximize the coverage here. Now you'll see if you play around with these devices, if you were to compress any of these pipes like this, it's a shield, it's a pipeline shield. You compress it like this. What you'll notice is that your coverage will approach 100%. If you compress it, the more you compress, the more the interstices are going to collapse and you're going to end up with like very, very high coverage. So this whole business of whatever percent is mentioned anywhere is all dynamic, right? We emphasize that a lot, especially in a situation like this where there's like uniform dilatation, you can really punch it up really nice. And that's what we do. Push it forward. There's the model view. You can see that a little bit better here. There we go. Opening well and deployed. Now, the question is what to do with the anti platelets, right? Everyone's wondering. Probably as many answers as there are people doing this. What we like to do is not load anybody on anything <clears throat> until they're in the procedure room. That would be given integrally. Now, we can give whatever, EPRO, whatever you want, but we tend to give integrally. We give it when the device is ready to be deployed. When catheters are up, when the pipe is up, wherever it needs to be, right before you unsheath, if everything is okay, that's when we get. We give a full loading dose typically. Um, 
because I'm sure there are other ways of doing it. We used to load before when we did with oil agents. Now I think the way things are, that's what we do. So here we go. Here's the angiogram frontal view. You see how you have a lot of coverage over here. Here's the lateral. Now notice imaging is important. Too many times when we see imaging, we don't see there are three things that need to be imaged and a pipeline. Pretty much any, any implant angiogram. One is the native view, unsubtracted with no contrast. You see the implant. Two, standard DSA. Three, native view, right? Unsubtracted view, so you can see the implant and the contrast at the same time. It's only on this view only in this view that you can tell that the proximal segment is not well opposed, right? Otherwise, unless you have motion or whatever, it's not so easy to tell. So these are the standard views. Okay, do we care about this? Of course we care. Are we gonna do anything about this? Yes. <clears throat> what we're going to do is we're gonna balloon this. Now, why do we balloon? Not for this necessarily, but the reason to balloon is to affect the gentle angioplasty. In these cases, it's important to make sure that your first device is very well seated, that the vessel is a little bit plasty, it's not often, not infrequently, it's a little bit narrow. And plasty gently, I think it's safe enough to allow it to reach more of what used to be the physiologic diameter of this thing, so that we minimize the chance of future adjustments, so to speak, to the device as time goes up. There we go. So we're going to use a balloon. We happen to have a high perform, so we're going to use that. You can use whatever flavor you like. <clears throat> it's important that the balloon not be too long. The one thing that's important is to have it short. This is a seven millimeter, four by seven. Now, why is it short? So that you can balloon the various segments. As we balloon, we expect the device to uh, either fall back or move forward as it opens. That's how loaded or this R graded devices. So we do this, uh, push a little forward, get the proximal segment, pull a little back, distal segment, and in the end, we end up with this. You see, still pretty good here. We're fine over here. A little bit of stasis, right? Now you see how much coverage you're getting. Okay, we put in two. We're gonna put in one more. Why? Because this is how we treat these. Blisters get at least two, maybe more. Here's another one. This is a four by 14. We decided to go with a 14 because we wanted to extend it a little bit lower down. If you notice, the proximal end of the first one was just at the ophthalmic acid. We just want it to be a little bit lower with the construct uh, to make sure that it's kind of clean. Just a couple of spot views. We wanted to uh, ensure that we weren't covering A1. Here we are. So post 375, 14, 414, you see how that comes down a little bit lower. We're doing good. Okay, there's the post. More stasis, you see that? More stasis. So definitely you have more coverage and more stasis inside. Now we got the balloon on the back. Why not use it again? Just we're gonna to make sure everything is fully good here. That's it, right? Everything close to done. I'll go back here and just to last to the segment again. Right here. I think it looks pretty good. <clears throat> Here, show you the post. So here is the post. A couple of these. You see how there's a little bit of less stenosis here. This is without the device. Now here's the device itself. 
that's going to have like a strategic construct value to it. You see how low coverage we have over this segment where we don't have to have a lot of it. Maximum coverage over the fusor forming, there is no dilatation. And minimal here, you see the difference between the overlapping two devices. And here's the one that's the 4 by 14 that's extended here. You see very, very open, the like cell kind of situation. Minimal coverage compared to this. This is probably 60, 70%. It's, really, it's going to be so hard to measure this. You can measure. You can actually go like this. If you wanted to measure what your actual coverage is, you could easily do it. Just go like that. So here's whatever, 1.3, right? Now you line it up. You're going to do it perpendicular. Here's going to be 0 0.9. There are four wires, one, two, three, four. There's three more in here, right? Each fourth one is made of platinum. So there are three more here that you can't see. So you're just gonna do simple math, calculate this. You know that the diameter of this wire is about 30 micron. And so from that, you can calculate your coverage easy enough. Now here, it's gonna be a little bit tougher. It's not perfect, right? Notice this. Obviously, this area gets a little bit. Now you have pull-up position here. You can go like this. Uh, yeah. You can see how in this area, you like. You see how the cells tend to overlap, kind of like they don't really overlap by half width. They're sort of lined up with each other. Now Kim was the first. Kim Nelson like really noticed that very very early that they tend to sort of line up next to each other and so you don't get great increase in coverage if your device diameters are more or less the same 3.75 and 4 is not that much different right if you really want difference go with it from 4 to 5 or whatever here we chose to do this because i think the major issue is to have the coverage in this segment and there <coughs> we're doing just fine Hard to tell exactly what you got here, but it's tight. So with that, um, I think we made the points. So any ways to skin this cat, probably, in terms of the techniques? You know, these are ours. We'll keep this um, individual on a drip, probably overnight. And depending on what their swallowing situation is, we'll convert them to most likely Berlin tech. Usually we tend to favor that in a baby aspirin and um, we go from there. So having said that, stop this share. I'd like to invite you all to our upcoming banana conference. You see over there, we're going to be presenting part of the program of this conference, which is available on the front page of Uranio.org. Part of the program will be some advanced discussions of posterior fossa and other flow diversion treatments, um, aneurysm treatments. Um, we invite you to join. Thank you and